those folks that came out today in person. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And uh, while you're at it, let's also give a hand clap to those individuals, our extended church family, joining us online. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We are grateful to every single one of you for joining us today to be a part of what is happening here at AWOFC. We're going to get ready to worship the Lord concerning our giving, so I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And uh, as we receive our offering, we're going to release our faith. We're going to pray concerning our offering, and then we are going to release our faith on 2 Corinthians 9th chapter, verse 8, which is our promise that we are standing on as a church. And I pray that you take it. Let me say this really quick. One of the things that really stuck out to us this weekend or this past week in the teaching, one of the most sobering subjects that was discussed and we'll be talking a little bit about it today, was the subject of tithing. And um, I, I want to be careful that I quote um, Brother Moore accurately. And he actually told the pastors, he said, go back and preach this to your churches. Is that right? Well, I don't see Chelsea. She was there. Is that right? He said, go back and tell this to your churches. Well, he talked about how he and uh, Phyllis, his wife, Sister Phyllis, how they got into tremendous or really bad financial trouble as a result of neglecting or not taking serious their tithe. And that how they learned that increase was connected to not only tithing, but also sowing. And how they had to learn to take it serious. How they had to learn to uh, value it and use their faith concerning it, okay? So I want you to understand as it relates to your tithe, not just those of you that are here, but those of you that are online. I know some of you are in other churches, but you still grace us with uh, following our material and, and uh, supporting us. We appreciate that. But your tithe, if you don't have it, can certainly complicate things in your life. I mean drastically complicate things in your life. Your tithe, you cannot afford not to do it and to do it with your heart. You have to tithe. Your tithe and your giving is with your heart. You expect for a return on everything you do. Amen. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. Now we're going to pray and then we're going to move. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the opportunity to be in the kingdom and we value it father we give you glory and we're so grateful lord to even be in the kingdom of god to be living under such an amazing system now out of obedience we give our tithe and we give it willingly we're not being forced or manipulated but it is our pleasure to give you the ten out of the 100% that you entrusted to us. Now, Jesus, high priest, Lord, we ask you to take our tithe and our offering to the Father and worship him on our behalf. And as you do so, we believe that we have tither's rights. And so right now, Lord, we claim tither's rights that the windows of heaven are open to us, the blessing is poured out on us in overflow, that as we've given, it's being given unto us with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men are giving into our bosom, thank you, Lord Jesus, and that the devourer is rebuked for our sake. Now I want you to repeat this after me and say, in Jesus' name, I decree, Okay, I'll wait till you're ready to do it. I'll wait till we'll start over. Wait till you're ready to do it. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name 
I decree. Say it like you mean it. Say, I decree that all grace is abounding towards me, making me sufficient, fully equipped in all things, equipping me to abound to every good work, every responsibility, and every assignment. I have more than enough. I'll never run out. I'm not going under, but I'm going over in Jesus' name. Now shout like you mean it one time. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Amen. You may have your seats if you would like to be a part of the offering today. Please go on awofc.org. There you will find many options to give from debit cards, credit cards, you name it, uh, cash app even, text to give as well. One of my uh, favorite ones uh, is uh, text to give and cash app. We don't see that cash app very many places, glory be to God. But uh, uh, it is uh, a wonderful, wonderful option as well. All right. Uh, let's get ready to move, and we're going to get ready to jump into the Word. And uh, right before we turn there, um, right before we get ready to pray, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get a couple of different texts here with me so that we are prepared to all move together because we're going to do some studying today. Did you bring your pens and papers and pencils? Yes, sir. Well, if you didn't bring them, do you have access to some? If you don't, raise your hand so we can get you some. Glory be to God. We want you to really um, follow along with us today. Those of you that are joining us at home, we're going to try to get posted everything we can on the feed. But uh, we would encourage you to uh, try to do your own turning. Uh, if you can. I know some of you are not watching this on the actual day. And uh, we also are excited about being able to release this word to even other ministers and uh, other pastors. Uh, and we pray that it is encouraging uh, to those folks as well. Glory be to God. Amen. All right. Turn with me. Get a couple of portions of scripture. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to look at verse 34. Thank you so much. You look so nice today, Aubrey. Sam Mercy. Look at my knee. Sam Mercy. Ooh, you're going to wait on that water. It, it's, uh, it needs some time. Sam Mercy. Thank you, Lord. How's everybody doing today? How was your week? Still saved? Just a, a little saved? Huh? All the way? Glory be to God. How about the word? Is it working for you? Anybody get any manifestation of good things this week? Well, by faith. Huh? So, Lord, I ain't seen it in the natural yet, but I believe it's already happened in the spirit. Well, glory be to God. I've seen a little manifestation this week. Have mercy. And it makes me excited. I am glad. You know, uh, let me say this really quick. And my clock has already started, but I am in, in uh, still precursor time. So don't hold that totally against me at the length of the video, okay? Um, I tell you, I'm still so full off of what we heard this past week that I almost don't want to preach what I have here to preach today, I almost just want to preach what was preached to me this week. I mean, the level of clarity and the anointing was so high that it's almost how dare I even attempt to preach anything different from that. Now, I'm not convinced that I can get it out the way he got it out, so I'm going to have to stay in my own lane for this week. Glory be to God. Um, but um, I will say this. One of the things that 
this sort of an unorthodox way to start a actual um, sermon, I guess, on a Sunday morning. But uh, one of the things that he really cleared up for me in the scripture is the portion of scripture where the statement is mentioned, um, whatever measure you meet shall be measured unto you. And then he mentioned a famous scripture that we use for giving that does also apply to giving, but there's a, another side of this text where it says give and it shall be given unto you with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And the key to this verse was this, shall men give into your bosom. Well, in the context of when Jesus was teaching about that, Jesus had been talking about judging that ye be not judged. And judging to the degree of condemnation and accusation uh, or criticism that you and I have given to other people or passed on other people that it shall be measured back to us with good measure, pressed down, <laughs> shaken together, running over, shall men give into our bosom or shall measure back the same thing to us. So however we treat other people as it relates to judgment is the same sort of judgment that is going to come back on us to the same degree. It is going to measure back exactly. So it was awesome. He was really encouraging and minister, exhorting us about the importance of staying away from things like strife and uh, envy, uh, particularly in the church world and the ministry world. Just really, really awesome. But I, that thing just blessed me that I just had to hear that come out of my mouth. It was so awesome. Glory be to God. Isn't that good? Yes. Now, um, we have been talking about for the past week or so, started last week, and we started to talk about a subject that we didn't get to finish that was based right here in Matthew chapter 6. And the title uh, of that subject was Great faith is the solution to worry and anxiety. Great faith is the solution to worry and anxiety. Now, we got over into dealing with um, what worry and anxiety is and anxiety, what it is and how we don't need to come into agreement with it, um, that it cannot really change anything um, that is happening in our life. And we even touched on the reality that it is a bad thing and that it can hinder some things and that the source of worry and anxiety and a worry and anxiety is uh, of a satanic nature and that Satan feeds us thoughts of worry and anxiety to keep us from moving forward. And that's pretty much as far as we got into that particular subject. But I didn't want to conclude this thing without going a little deeper, because we have to talk about the solution to this and uh, what part faith has to play in this uh, I'll tell you this particular subject um, is, a, is a really detailed subject and uh, I, I feel like I almost would need an additional month to two months to really exhaust this subject. So I'm going to attempt to condense this and get it out today in a way um, that uh, um, hopefully will answer questions give you revelation, and get it done in a reasonable amount of time so we don't worry your patience here today. Amen? Um, before we do that, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
Lord, before I do anything else or go any further, I want to take the opportunity to first of all thank you, give you glory, and I bind up every spirit of distraction, of hopelessness, of callousness where the heart is concerned. I bind it, and devil, I break your power right now in the name of Jesus. Now, I loose compassion in the atmosphere over the uh, internet even that causes the hearts to soften right now in Jesus' name that opens up the eyes of the understanding and produces ears that are willing to hear right now in the name of Jesus. An anticipation that pulls on the anointing that is present here on me today. And that anointing will flow and uh, it will be confirmed with signs, wonders, and miracles in those that hear today. The questions will be answered. Lives will be changed. And this work will go forward. This word unhindered by Satan or any of his camp. Lord, I thank you that this word will be declared with utterance excellence, boldness, and accuracy with your help today, Lord. I thank you for that, and I believe it is happening now. In Jesus' name, amen. So, one of the things that I'm, one of the major things that I've learned and am still learning, I want to make the disclosure always concerning my life that Paul made and he said not as though I have already obtained. So the case is never really that where we present the gospel as though we've um, reached a level where you can't go any higher, uh, where you're not still growing, where you're not still learning. And um, certainly that is, has been the case with me and still the case, still learning and still growing. Uh, nevertheless, in the process, there are certain things that I have learned, certain things that I have uh, experienced, manifestation that I have gotten, failures and mistakes uh, that I have, or mistakes that I have made. And um, one of the things that I've learned and am learning concerning living by faith, and that's what we're talking about here today, we're talking about living by faith. Um, I am not anointed per se to be a motivational speaker. That is, there are people that are anointed for that. And although I may say things that are motivational, um, my effectiveness deals with um, preaching and teaching the word of faith. So in most cases, not in all cases, I am addressing people that are desiring to live a Christian life where they are using their faith, uh, where they subscribe to a life of excellence and exploits and supernatural living. That is the um, target audience, I think I heard somebody say today, that our voice is designed to go after and to reach, okay? And um, one of the things I've learned about living here by faith is living this way is that number one, the lifestyle is not a magic lifestyle, okay? And what do I mean by that? And I'm just being led of the Holy Ghost and hopefully we'll get to the text. When I say it's not a magic lifestyle, um, 
I believe that there is a testing and a proving. It's really hit me this week meditating on this. A testing and a proving to where God isn't able to put us in a particular place without us being able to demonstrate that we can be trusted in that place. That not only can we be trusted to do the right thing, but that we can be trusted to consistently and continually do the right thing. And he has a way of verifying that, and his vetting system is so perfect and so complete that when we get to these places, or we're placed in these places, he already knows what we're made out of. He knows what kind of people we are. Now, does this mean that you have to be perfect? Absolutely not. But it does imply that we have to learn from our mistakes and actually make the adjustments so that we grow and do better moving forward. Does that make sense? And so that rubs my flesh <laughs> the wrong way at times because I, my flesh kind of, uh, part of my, this flesh suit that I was born into and that expresses itself as a result of the things that I have experienced, the things that I, that I have been indoctrinated concerning, um, it prefers for, it prefers kind of an abracadabra situation. That, hey, you know that I'm trying, so why don't you just go ahead and do this, Lord? You know that I'm trying, let me poof. Just be at a place where I have arrived. And then, Lord, to be totally honest, that part prefers to live happily ever after. Right? But I found out that uh, Brother Hagin says is if it did work that way, I guess we all be on easy street. Glory be to God. So, no. There are, if I want to be a great doctor, then I'm going to need to go to school and put in the time and develop in a knowledge base and demonstrate the knowledge and skill set and ability to be able to be a great doctor. I don't want to be operating on someone's brain and I have no idea what to do, right? So the same thing with the Lord in faith living, it's, this thing is not a race, it is a marathon, and it's a sort of a marathon where we continually increase. So the Lord shows us the things that we need to make adjustments in, and we make those adjustments. When we make those adjustments, we're demonstrating that we understand, and that we've learned, and we got it. And now we're um, equipped, if you will, to move to another level. Does that make sense? Uh, this week we heard uh, ministered so awesome. Uh, one of the themes of, the, of what we heard this past week was to come up, step up, right? rather, step up, going higher. Okay? So... Where the Bible is concerned, what we're teaching here as it relates to living by faith is designed to identify the things that we need to learn, understand, and then act on in order to get the results that we are seeking to get. Now that is... What's the word counter culture? Is that the word or is it cultural in the context? What the counter culture, right? To the religious or the religion way of doing things. 
because in religion, I can sort of unscrew my brain a little bit and I don't really need things like, I don't need as much discipline and um, uh, diligence. Right. Don't preach it then. Brother, uh, what, uh, brother Bill wants to say, I'm, I'm going to preach this, I'm going to preach it, but that's a good word. Right? I like it. Uh, diligence and to apply myself, right, to really, um, as a matter of fact, if something is difficult or hard, religion will teach you to avoid it. That there's no way it could be God if you have to press this way. If you, as a matter of fact, one scripture says that we are to endure hardness as a good soldier, right? So I find that as I learn and I make the adjustments that I increase. Does that make sense? Spiritually, right? Um, physically, socially, soulishly, and financially. Now, uh, here, uh, Jesus is dealing with the very real dynamic of even living by faith that you and I are going to face. Um, particularly as it relates to things like um, our provision or situations that are impossible that we can't always fix by our natural efforts alone, okay? And those situations cause things like anxiety and worry, okay? And the instruction here is a, just a really straightforward warning concerning anxiety and worry that says do not take fault or come into agreement with it. Now, when I hear things like that in the scriptures, one of the first places my mind goes to is, can you guess why? And I, I teach from that angle, right? I minister from that angle. Why should I not? Now, common sense says that if he's saying don't do it, there's probably some kind of consequence to it. But you know me, Lord, I want to know more. Tell me more about this, okay? Now, if you look at verse 34 here, this is a scripture that has given me fits, honestly. It has given me fits in trying to understand it. Because I typically have not been interested in a surface understanding of the scripture. I need something that I can walk away with understanding so that I can do it and act on it. All right? Especially when it pertains to areas in, in my life or things that I'm dealing with. And so I, I could take the easy way and just say from a loose translation here, uh, you know, don't worry about being anxious. You know, don't be anxious or worry because uh, uh, the morrow or tomorrow will uh, work itself out. You know, don't worry about what's going on. Just don't worry. Things will work out. Now, when I look in this text, I have to start breaking it down. And uh, we broke down a little bit. Take therefore no thought actually means or mean, meant not to come into agreement with um, thoughts concerning anxiousness and that, that produce anxiousness or worry. Not to come into agreement with the feeling of dread of a possible future situation going bad. Or something going bad that's in front of me. We've established that, right? We're all on the same page about that. Now, this part right here, thought for the morrow. Well, I looked that up and I saw morrow actually means tomorrow, right? Pretty <laughs> simple there. Morrow, just as an old English uh, uh, word that really does go back to 
uh, the meeting tomorrow. Now, tomorrow in the text, though, can in the text right here in the Greek can imply the physical space of 24 hours, right, being 24 hours from right now, but also in, it is the idea here of things that are happening later or in front of where you currently are. Now, I thought about this and I said, Lord, is this, for this thing to imply tomorrow as opposed to just in my future, let's say 10 years from now, six months from now, you know, I, I can swallow that a little better, but this tomorrow seems to mean actually tomorrow. And it does. Tomorrow is literally as specific as 24 hours in our time from the day you are currently in. Furthermore, what I do today can affect my tomorrow even 24 hours from now. Are you still here or have you gone home? Have I not come around to your backyard yet? Don't worry about it. I'm coming. Got some for you. Have mercy. Now, why is tomorrow so important? And what affects my tomorrow that I could be doing today? Well, he says, take no thought or don't be anxious or worried. So my worrying and anxiousness for today can have a huge impact on what I am going to experience tomorrow. Are you with me? Yes. So that makes my that makes the idea of being anxious and worry anxious of worrying and being anxious a spiritual thing and not just a natural thing. So Jesus is ministering from the perspective of an individual in the spirit realm that knows how things work. Ooh, I'm feeling anointed in the house. Hallelujah. Right? And he says, hey, there is a spiritual dynamic to the spirit of anxiousness and worry that you're never supposed to come into agreement with, have fellowship with, or entertain because it is a spiritual thing. Right? And that if you entertain it today, it will affect your tomorrow. How do I know that? Watch this. For the morrow, meaning what? Tomorrow. tomorrow, which is as soon as what? 24 hours from us. Woo, you learn you write this down, ain't you? Have mercy. Watch this. Shall take thought for the things of itself. Watch this. There are things that are on schedule in the sense of, hey, man, if you mess with worry and anxiety today, then it's going to throw you off schedule. Tomorrow, the things of God that otherwise would be working with you or working for you are going to be thrown out of order. Do you see that? Yeah. Now watch this. That's take no thought for it will take thought for the things of itself. Now watch this. Sufficient unto what? The day. What day? My present day, where I currently am, before 24 hours from now. Sufficient unto the day is the evil or the wickedness, right? Or the twisted attempts of the enemy to stop me for tomorrow. I've got to, when I get born again, I was brought into a system of living called the kingdom. And now in that kingdom, I have been wired and designed. It's been written in such a way concerning my life that requires me 
to be on task. Right? And that task is a daily task. Do you see that? And you'll notice that prayer Jesus taught is connected to this. Right? When he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us what? This day, our what? Daily bread. And he says, pray this way. Right? So my daily prayers, uh, my daily sufficiency is important for today so that it does not disrupt what needs to happen tomorrow. When you mix this with it, we're seeing a picture that, hey, there are traps that the enemy has set for you tomorrow that have to be dealt with today. You see that? And the traps for the following day are going to be dealt with when? Tomorrow. Do you see that? Because tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to get on task and you're going to be prepared for what's coming the next day. Right? It's wonderful about God that he only wants you to do this thing one day at a time. Isn't that good? Ooh, one day. Now what happens? Jesus says, when you give in to worry and anxiousness, what you are doing is you're trying to fix something that is outside of your jurisdiction or time assignment to fix. Mm -hmm. oh, you didn't get it, Chad. I got to keep moving. You, you, oh, don't, you, don't, you don't got it, Chad. I, I, I got to move. You know, you were a faith people, boy. You got to jump. You got to go ahead. You got to go. You got to go harder. Don't come at all, boy. I tell you what. Now watch this. Now turn over to Luke, chapter twelve. If uh, Sister Shaby was here, she said, just go on, preach, Pastor. We listening. We getting it. Just go on. <laughs> she said, just go on. We getting it. Keep going. <laughs> now watch this. You know, that's my, that was my amen corner right there. You know, let me say this. And in, in I don't care who the pastor is, there's a certain amount of support that the pastor is dependent on where his congregation is concerned, to be able to minister effectively. And when you identify those people, those people can release a strength and an encouragement to leadership that otherwise he wouldn't have without that. So the pulpit and the pews work together. You see what I mean? The supply that is coming through your man of God to you is connected to the supply that comes through you to pull it out of him or her. Does that make sense? So if either one neglects their responsibility, when? Today. This Sunday. <laughs> it may have an effect on what happens 24 hours from today, which is when? Monday at this church. You see what I mean? But it's great when you've got somebody, you got somebody up there that's just got that amen corner and they're, and they're genuinely for you. Because, you know, pastors know who is genuinely for them and who's not. You know, they can recognize the Jezebel spirit. Jezebel spirit praises you out in the pub, in the open, but undermines you, runs you down, talks about you privately. And the pastor could see it, may not always choose to deal with it like, the, like we should at times, but at the very least, you can recognize when it's there. And when you got one that's good right there, you're like, glory be to God, just gives you that extra push. Now, you can't depend on it, glory to God, you can't depend on it too much, but that's another subject, I got to move. Now, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 I want you to look really quick at this verse for me, which is going to get pretty interesting. Verse 23. Now, this is Jesus writing about the, this is Jesus in the same conversation. This was recorded by both Luke as well as Matthew. So Luke and Matthew were there hearing this whole 
teaching that Jesus was talking about in this setting, Luke wrote a portion of it that was recorded, and Matthew wrote the other part that was recorded. Synoptically is what that means. They're written that way, and we put these together to come up with sort of the full picture of what was happening, the setting, and uh, what he was saying t in his totality. Does that make sense? Yes. You don't even got to pay for I won't even charge you for that. You just got that free. Glory to God. Now, look what he says right here. Talking about Jesus, and he said unto his disciples, I'm reading in verse 22 for context, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, uh, neither for the body what you shall put on. Now, he's talking about right here, he zeroes into provision, right? What you shall eat is what you need to live and what you shall put on. This is indicative of your provision. You could put right here your bills, your rent, your car note, your career, your job, whatever the case may be, all right? Are you with me? Now, watch this, verse 23. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Now, usually when you see the word life in the New Testament, it's the Greek word zoe. But here, it's not zoe. In the Greek here, the word is a little different. Um, it is the word suke, okay? And the idea of suke here is the life within. It is you from the inside. Now, let me help you distinguish here. Zoe is the life force of God that gives life to the real you, your spirit man on the inside. Right here, when he's talking about life, he's not really talking about the life force of God in you. He's talking about you, you individually, you are worth more or life for you is more than meat. Okay. Now, meat is the idea of what is physical or your outward circumstances. Okay. So he says here, don't be worried concerning things that are uh, things that are happening because life and the problems you face, watch this, are not natural. See, once you got born again, you move from a natural life to a supernatural life. Furthermore, when you have problems, look at the rest of the text right here. Um, read the rest of that verse. Watch this. Um, and the body is more than raiment. That word raiment, I, I don't mean to get too detailed, but I got to give you this. Raiment is something that was put on the outside of the body. And Jesus says here, what's going on with you is bigger than the outside. It is about living from the inside out. So when I have issues, when I have problems, particularly concerning my provision, right, then I need to address those issues from the inside out first and not the outside in. So when I run into issues financially, the first thing I need to check as opposed to changing my job is where is my time? Do you see that? And how is my tithe? Am I placing weight uh, value on my tithe? Because I must honor him concerning the act of the giving of my tithe so that he will honor me. In Malachi, the third chapter, those people were tithing, but the whole time they were tithing, they were talking going under. They were disgruntled. I do this and I'm still struggling, so forth and so on. Did, did you see this? So I live from the inside out. I go and I start checking spiritual principles, spiritual things, and making sure those are lined up in order to fix what I'm facing in the natural. So when I start struggling financially, I'm like, okay, Lord, 
What's going on with my tithe? What do I need to adjust? What, in what way do I need to repent? Are you with me? Do I need seed? It's another subject. We'll get there. Ooh, how am I doing on time? I'm out of time, man. I got five minutes. Lord have mercy. I'm going to keep going. Can you handle a little bit more? Yeah. I'm going to ask you how Brother Keith asked us this week. He said, you ain't got nothing to do, B. You got nowhere to be, B. Is it more important? <laughs> he said, is it more important? Clearly, you know what we were going to say. Didn't matter how long we were there. No, it's not. But let me tell you what that is. It's valuing the word. We go on these meetings. Yes. We were in a meeting this week. This we service started at around 6.30. We didn't leave the building from service as well as dinner till about 11.30. Well, close to 11.30 at night, right? Okay. Almost midnight when we left. But you know what we did? Even if your eyes go Chinese, you know what? You sit there and act like you're full of the joy of the Lord. You know what that is? That's honor. That's measuring. That's valuing the word. And when you do that, guess what? It will, it's dishonorable to sit there when you're hearing the word and yawn and give off a disposition that says, I don't want to hear. I'm tired. It's dishonorable. And what happens to those people? That word that they just heard was pointless practically. Yeah. It's not going to measure back anything to them. Yeah, you see? What should our attitude be when we are hearing the word? Lord, if I have to discipline myself to receive it, I'll do it. That's good. That's good. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We don't care how long Brother Copeland preached. We're going to be there. We're going to be quiet. And we're going to receive. We're going to amen till he's done. Now, is it always easy? We don't want me to talk about whether it's easy. Now, what we'll be talking about. <laughs> right? Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that the recommendation is that the pulpit takes the liberty to hold you hostage. Right? Uh, don't get me wrong. There's a balance there. But I'm saying you can't control their part. You control your part. You be honorable because it's going to pay off for you later. Does that make sense? He, it was actually talked about really quick in this meeting that uh, he said, you know, and it was amazing for us to look around and see how many other pastors were here, were there. And it was the consensus that we all had to sacrifice practically to get here. There were people there, a majority of the, a good portion of the pastors there, basically the consensus was we sacrificed to get away. There are people, pastors there that are working full-time jobs. They had to leave the job. They had to take their kids. They had to come up with the money to be able to pay to get there and to get back, which is not cheap. It cost. And then get back and still fulfill their responsibilities when they get back. And when they get back Sunday morning on church, all the people in the church, churches typically are concerned about, particularly those that are dishonorable, is what are you here to do for me today, pastor, whatever? Does that make sense? Yeah. When in actuality, you need people that are checking on you. Like, hey, pastor, I just want to see how are you guys doing. Are you okay? Pull over, get some. My, uh, my assistant, my secretary, calls and says, now you, if you get sleepy, you pull over, okay? <laughs> That's she says, is that okay? You guys pull Oh, no. That's such a long drive. You didn't have to go with, oh, 10 hours. That's a long time, Mr. Cooper. You need, to, you need to get some sleep, okay? We'll talk about, we'll do the rest tomorrow, okay? You see, that's honor. Now, people that, if you're writing their paycheck, they'll honor you that way. But the church people that are not getting a paycheck need to have that same kind of honor. Isn't that good? That's right, this is a paycheck, glory to God. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, do you know, by the way, that your leaders need you? Yes. Do you yes. understand, Anointed Word of Faith Church, that it is absolutely necessary to come alongside of your leaders to support them? 
Do you understand how important that is? I mean, Paul said that in the beginning of the gospel, every church forsook me, except for the Philippians. Do you know the Philippians were primarily responsible for the reason that the gospel was preached and got here to you and me today? Out of all the people that should have been supporting, only one group was willing to come alongside the man of God because they were honoring God is who they were honoring. You see? Whereas the other church is like, man, I ain't got time for that. I got to do me. I got this going on. No, 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 no. The, that leader is valuable to the quality of life connected to the people that he or she is ministering to. If you pay attention, if you displace the voice that has been ministering to you, it will change your entire lifestyle. It will affect your entire lifestyle. You will have to make an adjustment. If I can't turn on, if I can't hear Brother Copeland's revelation coming out, if I can't hear Bill Winston, if I can't hear Keith Moore, if I can't hear Jerry Savelle, it is going to affect a portion of my life. I am going to have to find an adjustment for that which is no longer there. Does that make sense? So what do we want to do? We want to keep them there. This is why we honor them. This is why we value them. This is why we sow seed. We need to give to make sure that they are still there, that they are still around. And in the church, it's the same way. So everything you do in the church is important. I must be talking about the Holy Ghost. I mean, every time you run a sweeper, every time you pick up food, every time you offer, and sometimes you offer help even if you're not asked. That's what honorable people do. And honor has been taken out of this generation. This generation is a me, 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 selfish, indoctrinated generation. And those are the people we come into the church indoctrinated, and the job of leadership is to, is to reroute that. Like, hey, I know you were taught to be selfish. Let me show you how to come out of yourself and be honorable. You see what I mean? And if you will be honorable to others, guess what? Others will be honorable to you. But you'll need to be honorable to others because if you don't, others will not be honorable to you. Does that make sense? Ooh, that's for the Holy Ghost. Now, let me move. Let me move. Now, Lord Jesus, I'm out of time. Lord, have mercy. Now, just jump down with me really quick to verse 28. Look to, at verse 28. Uh, let's read, read verse 27. Let's turn the heat down two notches, please. Um, somebody, if you don't mind, just to thank the Lord. Have mercy. It's out of your Jesus. Either that or I'm, I'm on fire for Jesus, one of them. <laughs> Look at verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they actually know. I, I hear you, Holy Ghost. Um, verse 24. Consider the ravens. Now watch this. For they neither sow nor reap. Consider the lilies. They neither sow nor reap. Now watch this. That's not you. You are not a lily. You do sow and reap. Are you getting that? You didn't get it. Let me say it over here. Jesus is pointing out to us, look, the lilies that don't even sow and reap like you and I do and must, what happens to those people? What happens to, to them? They don't have a storehouse nor a barn, but God still feeds them, provides them. How much more are ye better than the birds or the fowls? So there's not a question here of whether or not God wants to do it. What's missing is sowing and reaping to get what he has already agreed to do. Wait a minute. We got to keep moving. Now, 
Read verse 28. Let's read this together on the count of three. King James, let's read this together. One, two, three, read. If then God so clothe the grass of the feet, uh, or the grass which is today, my apologies, in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Now, wait a minute. Here's the part. Oh, ye have little faith. Are you connecting the dots right here? God wants to do it. He does it for people that can't do it for themselves, and you're more valuable to him than that. You live from the inside out, not the outside in, but sowing and reaping connected to your faith is the problem. Do you see that? Now watch this. How do I know that? How do I know that? Now, he points out, oh, ye have little faith. I did some research and etymology right here to a degree about little faith. Is this just King James jargon about faith in general? You know, some people will argue there's no such thing as little faith or big faith. You don't need a different degrees of faith. I beg to differ. Little faith right here in the Greek is translated faith that is small or little. Jesus is talking about that kind of faith in this particular case saying that it is not enough. That you need a bigger portion of this faith, particularly as it relates to your provisions, things that are causing anxiousness and worry. Do you see that? Particularly concerning those things, you need more faith and it is closely connected to your sowing and reaping. Now, I can't make the case off of that without looking at it further in the text to prove that, right? What does he say about that? Verse 29, verse, um, what was that? Verse 28. Now, look at verse 29. Or actually, yeah, verse 29. Look what he says. And seek not... Ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Don't try. It's not a natural problem. Look what he says. Neither be ye of doubtful mind. Doubtful mind in the Greek is actually translated this way. It means to be in the Greek. It actually means to be in between in midair. It was used to describe someone in this context that is going back between fear and hope. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. This describes somebody that is, okay, my bills that are need to be needing to be paid, my needs that are really need to be met here, is it, can I just fix this thing naturally or do I really need to believe God to do for me what I can't do for myself? Do I need to be dealing with this spiritually instead of naturally, right? This person is going in between. Now Jesus says, don't live there. Don't go there. Do not be in between. An unstable man is what? A, a, a uh, what's this, what James says? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And he went on to say, let not this man think he will what? What? He will what? Receive anything from the Lord. Now, watch this. Sobering effect. If I were a media uh, person, I would have, I would take out this portion of the quote and I would put up something big that was sort of pulsating in and out, like a like red or something that was saying sober, sobering effect, sobering effect, right? And I would highlight this. Th 
this won't be fixed if I don't cooperate with God's system. I must make the actual adjustment to get the results that I need in this area. Right? Yeah. Whatever those adjustments are, I must make. And that is so unpopular. Because what is preached, unfortunately, to people at times is, oh, don't worry about, honey, just turn it over to Jesus and he'll work it out. No, he will not. <laughs> Pastor Moore said, Keith Moore said, God, you can't turn over to God what he has turned over to you. You must make the adjustment. You must make a conscious, informed, intentional, willful, skillful adjustment to rise above the current circumstance. Now, the good news is you can do it, guess how soon? Just like that. Well, repentance is one of the best tools right here because repentance done in faith says, okay, Lord, I see it. I see where I missed it. Forgive me. Cleanse me from the unrighteousness associated. I believe I received my forgiveness and my cleansing win. Now. Right now, and, de and devil, I restrict you from bringing any future judgment or punishment on me because Jesus has already paid the price. He was wounded. For my mistakes, my oversights, my disobedience, and even my rebellion. Glory be to God. You see that? So you don't have to come into anxiousness after you repent like, oh, Lord, now i got to deal with this punishment coming up because I don't mess up. No, no, no. Enter in by faith. I come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy to receive help in the time of need. I don't care how bad it would have been. It won't be quite as bad because I have made the adjustment from the inside out and corrected what I know to correct. Isn't that good? Ooh Lord have mercy, Jesus. Now, let me just say this, okay? I'm, 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 done. I'm, I'm pretty much done. I'm done. Baptist clothes. Look at this. Now, um, verse 29. Isn't that something? And that's something. That's good news, ain't it, Chelsea? Well, Lord, who is it on to fix it? The people that are with you. We come up with solutions together. Glory be to God. Now, we're going to approve them and so forth, but it should be uh, the healthy concern of a problem to be solved by more than just the pastor. And that's what we're believing for, right? We released our faith concerning time, tools, and what? Teams. Glory to God. Now, <clears throat> verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Look at verse 31. But seek ye first, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. And um, Matthew said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right here it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So correct here would be, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Provision, right? What you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. Now. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the what? Why not to give you the provision? Why not to give you the provision? Why the kingdom? Because the kingdom is the key to the provision. What in the kingdom? The principles of the kingdom. Right? What principles in this case? Here it is. 
I know I went over, but I had to get this out. I would not be able to rest if I didn't get this out. I could not wait till next Sunday because Satan would steal it from me. Okay? So that's why we went longer here. Are you okay with that? Okay. Watch this. Here it is. Can you, Sister Lita, will you read this, this verse for me? Read it long, read it loud and strong right here. Verse 33, read that for me. So then you have now, wait a minute. Woo-wee. I got to go Pentecostal on you. In light of what we've been talking about, in this conversation, Concerning seeking first the kingdom of God to get our needs met, our provision, needing faith, a sufficient amount of faith concerning it, sell that ye have. Take what you have that's valuable and convert it to a usable currency. Now, th- this can be, even if you don't have physical money, let me tell you what, you can so, in, when I was in prison and I first saw, started learning this, I didn't have money, so what I would do is I would go find people in, on the prison yard, and I would say, hey, explain to me about something, problem you're dealing with right now. And they will explain to me, What I would do is I would go in the Word and research the solution to their problem, and then I would go and write it out by hand, like two or three pages written out in explanation, and then I would go give it to them, and I called it seed. I would be writing out five or six of these a day sometimes, multiple times. I'm writing them out, and I called it seed. Do you know what happened to that seed? It turned into money. And you know what I did once it turned into money? You know what I did? Then I started tithing off of it, off of the money that was coming in. Sell what you have. What do you have? Where your provision is concerned, it requires you to let go of something in your hands. How do you get your financial needs met? You must give. They don't like church. Religion doesn't like that, does it? You must give to fix it. Any, anything you are in pursuit of, financial. See, your increase requires sowing in order to get a harvest. Now watch this. Sell that ye have and do what? Give alms. By doing this or by Sowing or giving, what happens? Provide yourselves bags, which means purses that contain treasure, like literal treasure chest, bank accounts, right? Which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens, money in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approaches, neither moss corrupteth. Now watch. For where your treasure is, notice this statement, and I'm going to close with this. Connect the dots. La, 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 la. Watch this. Where your treasure is or your money is, the place where your money is helped, is kept. Let's scroll up verse 34 for me, please. There will your heart be Also, here's my question to you. From what we've studied so far, and that's what we did today, we studied. Where does heart play into this? From what we've read, where does heart come into this whole scenario? Why is that relevant to the content that we just uncovered? Why is the heart relevant? Do you see it? Let me show you the verse. 
that makes the heart relevant. Scroll back up to verse 23 for me. Verse 22, let's read verse 22. Why is the heart and the treasure, why is that relevant? Why is sowing to get your provisional needs met, the things that cause worry and anxiety, why is sowing faith and the heart all connected right here? What does this heart matter? Verse 22, and he said unto his disciples, his disciples these are his people, He's talking to his, the people of God right here, right? Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall what? What ye shall eat, neither for what? The body, and what ye shall put on. Say provision. provision. That's what we're talking about. Concerning provision, I'm going to need to not enter into anxiousness or worry. What's going to keep me from doing that? Because I'm going to respond to it. And I'm going to respond to it by doing what? Sowing. Sowing. If I have a financial struggle, I need to sow. Now watch this. For where your treasure is, your heart is there. Your spirit, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Now watch. Verse 23. The life. Did you get it? I know you have to be deep to get it, but I'm telling you, do you see this? The life is more than meat or natural. The heart is it's synonymous right here with your needs are met from doing spiritual things and not just natural things. My natural circumstances is fixed by engaging in spiritual principles and disciplines. In this case, what is the discipline? What do I need to do to fix it? I need to sow. And when that seed is in the ground, now you can mix it. Now you got something to mix your faith with right here. Glory be to God. Woo, you can go to the devil and say, devil, now -uh, I ain't going under. I have tithers' rights. Glory be to God. As I'm given, it shall be given unto me. He will meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My venture will be successful. I will increase. You see that? But I'd say it anyways. Prospering, increasing, worry and anxiety cured from the inside out. Glory to God. Did you get something out of that today? Come on, let's stand and let's give the Lord a praise. Come on, let's praise like it's 10,000 of you in here. One time. Come on, clap your hands. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you, sir. We give you honor that there is an answer to anything we face. And Lord, you give us clear instruction in your word today, which you so graciously uncovered for us. That the areas that produce worry and anxiety in our lives, particularly where our provisions are concerned, situations that have gotten so big that there's no natural way to fix them. That you have provided a way of escape concerning these things. And in this area, Lord, sowing and reaping is a spiritual 
principle and discipline that is much stronger than simply worrying about it or toil over it could ever be. That as we sow and as we reap, we are encouraged to step over into a place of faith. Faith says, my God desires to meet my needs now. In this situation. And Lord, we believe it. We take it. We receive it. And our corresponding action to our faith says we sow. And as a result of our seed, we will reap. We place value on it. We value it. We measure it back. So we're not going to try to fix our situations naturally. We're going to fix it supernaturally. We're going to do what your word says. We're going to abandon our natural attempts. And we're going to do it the way your word says do it. We're going to do it in faith. We're not going to do it in fear. We're not going to do it out of manipulation. But we're going to do it in faith. Practically do one offering here a week. But as I was praying there, the Lord impressed upon me. He said, Al, make the opportunity to sow for whatever they're needing available right now today. And uh, when I was growing up, man, I never understood this dynamic working. And understand you're not sowing for my needs. You're sowing for your needs. But I believe there is an anointing present and available that if the Lord speaks to your heart to sow for something you are dealing with, you need to sow. That's not just the people that are here in person, but the people that are online. If particularly if you've been dealing with the situation that has been producing worry and anxiety that you cannot fix yourself, then I'm telling you your, your situation is spiritual and not natural. You need to fix it from the inside out by using the principles of the kingdom of God. Demonstrated in this text today is sowing. Glory be to God. Now that's why we had to sow that seed this morning, Sister Chelsea. But I believe we're going to sow another seed. Glory be to God. Have mercy. Listen, if you'd like to be a part of this, go to awofc.org. You'll get your seed in the ground. And when you get your seed in the ground, you place a demand on it. You do it in faith. You do it in faith. And watch God do for you what you could never do in your own strength. Do you receive that? That's good. I'm telling this from the throne right there. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I believe we, we received the impartation this week. I believe we got that thing. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Kare tene korota lese, kondare se korota na seke me koda. Yes, Lord, I will say that. When you sow this seed, whether you do it online or envelope, whatever you do, you need to name that seed for what you are believing for. But when you send this seed in, I want you distinguished. I want you to distinguish this type of seed. Okay? 
You're going to distinguish this seed as the key to worry and anxiety. That's how you're going to distinguish this seed for worry and anxiety. Glory be to God. I'm sowing too. I'm sowing too. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just you got that written down? Seed for worry. I pray, Lord, for supernatural harvest 100-fold in the area that these seeds have been sent out in. And I thank you that the seed is being sown with their heart. You love a cheerful giver. Not a manipulated giver. Not a pressured giver. As we sow this seed out of our heart, we believe we receive increase on it. 100 fold. Lord, even as this seed comes out of here, this church today, and tools. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Woo, we got faith for that, don't we? We're in agreement about that. Come on, let's give the Lord one more shout of praise. We got something. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We thank God for everyone that made it to the end today. We bless you. We pray that this word is working for you. And I just want to really quick pray for anybody that's online that comes across this video that you may not know the Lord. And I just want to pray for you right now so that you can make him today your father. Make Jesus your redeemer, your big brother. And be ushered into this great kingdom. I want to pray a simple prayer for you. You pray it with me and believe it from your heart. And it'll be done today. Today, your name will be written in the book that guarantees salvation. And I want you to pray and just say, Lord, I believe that you are who you say you are. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. You made a way for me to have life abundantly. I repent of my sins. I understand I was born separated from you. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Take my life. Do something great with it. I commit, Lord, to live for you. Make me born again. I receive it. I take it. I have it now. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise for that. Amen. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you've been it from your heart, that today you have been born again. You have been given new life. Let us know so that we can encourage you, so we can get some materials out to you to be a blessing and an encouragement to you in your new life. Amen. We thank God for everything that is going for today. I want you to help me with this last statement as we dismiss. And it simply says, okay, they make sure I don't get it wrong right here. What I'll read, I'll, uh, I'll read the first part. I'll stop at you and then you guys join me in the rest. What is, what's in front of you? you've ever seen. Glory be to God. Thank you for joining us. We love you. Consider yourself